Hi, everyone. Welcome to week two. This is a two-part lecture looking at the history of books and magazines. We're, we switch things around a little, so we're going to be looking at the historical periods rather than starting with the contemporary, doing all of our history, and then coming back to the contemporary again, which felt a little jostled to me. So hopefully this works for everybody. Because everything got moved around, please make sure that the dates that you signed up for mass media mini lecture topics still work for you because things got moved by a week. So that might change things for you if you picked a, a topic based on your availability to do that work during a specific week. So just double check and make sure it still works. Feel free to change it if it doesn't. For everyone who hasn't signed up yet, remember to do that by the end of this week. Okay, let's get into it. We're going to start with books and the history of print technology. Hopefully you have watched The Machine That Made Us, Stephen Fry, looking at the history of the Gutenberg printing press to give you a little bit of a sense of how revolutionary it really was to suddenly be able to reproduce text this quickly. Okay, so our book lays out in this nice timeline the prehistory of the book through the early phases of the book. I'm not going to get super into detail going through this whole process, but important things to know are that originally text was carved into stone or buildings or other things, and so it was not movable. So if we think about the birth of the book, the first phase is really the ease of portability. So the invention of things like papyrus scrolls, and early Chinese books and later the codex in Europe, what we're really talking about is the ability to easily transport writing from one place to another. And then the next phase that happens is reproducibility. So whether that starts with the handwriting reproducibility of the codex or the next move being sort of Chinese woodblock prints that reproduce an entire page at once, so rather than movable type, what you have is a carved surface that has all of the letters and any images that might appear on a single page. So you need one for each of each side of a page in order to make this book. So if you imagine you're still reproducing these sort of quite heavy wooden carved sheets that need to be pressed each time you want to make a single page over. So still quite heavy, still quite difficult to navigate. The next phase is the birth of movable type. And this happens in China in the year 1000 of the current era, basically only about a thousand years ago. And what that leads to is the possibility of being able to easily and quickly remake pages of different things. So I don't need to carve an entire sheet out for each sheet that I'm trying to print. I don't have to carve a whole block. I can move independent pieces around and easily reproduce different things and change what I'm producing without having to have these many wooden blocks accumulating in a print shop. And then, so our book says that happens. The development of movable type also happens independently in Europe about 400 years later. In all truth, it probably doesn't happen independently. It probably happens because of trade with China and the awareness of movable print in other parts of the world, and then Europe reproduces it. The innovation of the Gutenberg press was not that it was the first to make movable print or the first to be able to make any form of printing press It was, or any form of printing rather. It's that it shifted the labor structure. So before the use of these very massive, as you see in the film, like wine presses that he uses to push the type into the paper. That would have all had to have been done by hand, by usually by multiple people with rollers. So the printing press is less about the ease of making the print itself as far as movable print, which is arguably a much bigger revolution. What it is is a labor reduction machine. So it takes one person to run as opposed to multiple people in a shop navigating a pre-press relationship to movable type, if that makes sense. So what's really critical about the Gutenberg press and movable type more generally is the ability to reproduce books very easily and very quickly, right? As we see in the book before that, 
things like illuminated manuscripts, which are codexes, so sewn together pages that had been handwritten. And in some cases, incorporated some degree of like woodblock printing. The Chinese had been doing that for quite a long time, actually. And European manuscripts sometimes incorporated some prints as well, but typically more for images or a framework that they worked around in handwriting. So the, the amount of labor that it took to produce a, an illuminated manuscript meant that there were very few of them reproduced. There are a few of them produced, and they were typically only for religious clerics, priests, and higher-ups in religious structures, and also the very wealthy who were often patrons of the church. And the monks and priests that would hand-write the manuscripts, and specifically typically Bibles, would produce special ones for the people who patronized the church, who paid for the costs of that church. And they were very precious objects. They included paints made from precious, precious stones like lapis lazuli from these vibrant blues that still exist or and, and often had a lot of real gold painted into them. So literacy was really limited at this point. It's not just that the book was limited to access and say we all went and looked at an illuminated land, a manuscript and read. It was that very few people had the capacity to read at all. So Again, mostly clerics and the extremely wealthy and people who were part of the merchant class um, would read for the purposes of trade. And that was really it. Other than that, you depended upon your priest to tell you what was happening in the Bible. You depended upon other people, town crier situations to tell you what was happening in, in the news of the day. People got this information in other ways besides reading. And so the Gutenberg Press and the sudden ease of reproduction of books, even just the Bible, had a radical impact on people's relationships and eventually led to the Protestant Revolution. So this is how we ended up with the notion that there should be more of a direct relationship to God, which was the, the edict of Protestantism, that it shouldn't go through the Catholic Church because there was suddenly this notion of a direct relationship to the text that told the stories. This also, then, if you start to imagine what happens at the birth of the encyclopedia and the sudden notion that people have direct relationship to information is incredibly drastic in a change for how people think about who has power, how the rights to knowledge, all of these things change because of the ability to reproduce text easily and in large numbers. As we saw on the last slide, by, this, by the mid-1700s, mid we've got the emergence of encyclopedias. We have a rapidly increasing literacy rate. And then, of course, all of this is just going to continue and go quite quickly, right? So all of these things will continue to expand more and more kinds of books, more and more literacy among, among the masses, radical changes. And the most important of these is, I'm not going to go into the details of things like different type systems like linotype and offset lithography. But the important thing to know is that you should look at you should look at those in the book because they are interesting, but it would make this lecture way too long. So the thing to think about is that we're also developing constantly new technologies to not only reproduce text quickly and easily, but also to be able to reproduce images. And this is really something that becomes really critical to the way that we think about what we'll look at in our next section of this this week is magazines and the importance of photojournalism and the image to the way that we tell stories, especially about the news and the contemporary moment. But all of these things are expanding and simultaneously we have the emergence of paperback books, which makes them not only easier to reproduce, but much more inexpensive to produce than, say, these leather-bound encyclopedias and precious classics that people tend to that are slide open with in the beginning of this. So paperback books become readily available. Literacy continues to spread. But I think we'll talk in a minute about some of the ways that becomes complicated as well. So, so at the same time, we have the formation of publishing houses really taking shape. So early prestigious publishing, 
tried to identify and produce the works of good writers. They saw themselves as bastions of culture. And many of these, the oldest publishing houses still exist, but they're under the con- like these conglomerate ownerships that we'll talk about a little bit later too. And the demand for books grew rapidly between 1880 and 1920. Uh, with the rise of industrialized urban culture. So people were in cities, had more access to books, were more interested in reading, wanted more and new books. And the book industry, our book says, helps assimilate European immigrants. What that really means is it standardizes American culture in a certain way, right? It's a way for people to all have access to the same notions and the same books and the same culture that makes some version of a standardized culture. And of course, what this means is it also is suppressing other things that don't fit into that. We'll get into this a little bit more when we do our week on film and we talk about cultural imperialism, because this is really a, the one of the beginning phases of it is through the book industry. So there's a small dip, there's a slight decline from 1910 through the 1950s in book production due primarily to the wars and poverty. So 1910, by the way, you should know is the Spanish is the beginning of the Spanish flu in the United States, which was a pandemic that we don't talk about very much. I think that's going to change because of COVID. But there was a radical effect on culture from this early 1900s, from the the many deaths of the Spanish flu around the world. But the United States and urban centers were particularly hard hit. And then immediately following, we have the second world, sorry, the first world war, followed by the depression, followed by the second world war. So it isn't really until the 1950s that the book industry bounces back when there's some relative degree of stability and economic improvement for the lives of most Americans, though certainly not all. I wanted to talk a little bit about the what happens with the expansion of paperback books. And things called either dime novels, which are these, you could buy a book for a dime, or even before that, penny dreadfuls, which were somewhere between a book and a magazine that were these sort of cheaply printed, small, serialized stories often that you could buy. And they were really sensational. I think what's interesting, and then later, obviously, in the 1950s, 30s, 40s, 50s, you have pulp fiction. At each new phase of the expansion of ease of publication and production, meaning the expansion of who's reading and how much is available, you have certain kinds of social panics over this sort of the moral effects of these stories and then also the potential danger that they pose to the sort of sacredness of the book, right? So they're destroying literature and the morality of young people. Um, In the 19th century, The Penny Dreadfall was a small, cheap, comic or storybook. And they often focused on macabre and sensational things. So these are actually our first vampire romance novels. So if any of you grew up reading Twilight or any of those kinds of things, this is exactly the sort of, that. this is the basis for a book like that. Um, and at the same time as this, Victorian novels were also thought to be too emotional for young women and would lead them to hysteria. Um, And it was suggested that they they should not be allowed to read fiction. Um, And when you get into the 30s and 40s, the Pulp Fiction book, which often dealt with things like homosexuality and drugs and also the lower classes. So people were, there were stories of imprisonment. There were all kinds of things, but they were also deeply sensationalized. These were thought to celebrate and spread drug use and, say, homosexuality. So with the expansion of publishing and publishing houses, we're also going to get different kinds of specializations among those publishing houses. So our book separates types of books. It calls it into four different categories. And the way to think about this is less about what is the book about than it is about who is the book's audience and therefore how does a publishing house specialize around it. Trade books are the books that we think of as our general consumption book. So everything I just listed, dime store novels, all of those things, but also most of all the fiction you read, even a lot of things that appear to be advice giving or nonfiction still fall under trade books. Professional books target various occupational groups and they're not intended for the general market. And so they don't even necessarily appear in the same line from uh, 
publisher to seller. So we wouldn't even necessarily see them in bookstores, right? They exist in other kinds of contexts. And then textbooks, like the one that we have for our class, have their own specific publishing houses um, or branches of existing conglomerates. And then finally, our religious books and texts of religious importance. So this would be um, Bibles, Qurans, et cetera, right? Um, and then also sometimes books that are supporting them. But m the majority of what you might think of as books about religion would still fall under trade. So as you can see here, the vast majority of books that are being sold regardless of format, are trade books. So this includes all of our fiction and all of the other things we were just talking about. And then these two together, higher ed and what's referred to as L high, that's education, like lower education, meaning grade school through 12. So this is K through 12 books, textbooks and things like that. And then this is higher ed. So some of the books that we read that are both textbooks, but also academic books that don't appear necessarily to be textbooks are included in this. And then we have the small professional and very small religious religious books, which is why I wanted to point out before that this refers specifically to religious texts and not necessarily to books about and around religion, because that actually would make up a fairly substantial um, segment of trade. As we suggested with the Penny Dreadfuls and Pulp Fictions, there's a general sort of anxiety very often about the effects of media and books are no exception. So the wide circulation of books gave many people the same opportunities to learn that were once available to only a very privileged few. However, as societies discovered that the, pow the power associated with books and the printed word, books were also subjected to a variety of censors in an attempt to manage their effects on society. In various parts of the world, some versions of the Bible, Karl Marx's Das Kapital, the autobiography of Malcolm X and Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses have all been banned at one time or another. One of the triumphs of the internet is that it allows digital passage of banned books into nations where printed books of that type have been outlawed. There's a difference between what we refer to as banned books and, book and challenged books. So each year, the American Library Association, the ALA, compiles a list of the most challenged books in the United States. A challenged book is a book that has had a formal request put in to have a book removed from a public library or school library's collection. Common reasons for challenges include sexually explicit passages, offensive language, occult themes, violence. There's a lot of requests for books about homosexuality to be removed, promotion of, relig promotion of a religious viewpoint, nudity and racism. So you can see that like the call for books being challenged happens on very different levels, different value structures lead to them, but always under the sort of model that whoever is making the request imagines that they're protecting children from something important. You'll see that one of the options you have this week is to think about for your writing assignment is to think about challenged books and to address them. Uh, so the ALA defends the right of libraries to offer material with a wide range of views. So they tend not to, they, they don't really respond to these, these requests for challenges very often. Obviously, certain, certain libraries and school systems do. Um, but the general opinion of the ALA is not to. Some of the most challenged books of the past decade have been I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. So that's actually a book that was published in, I believe, the late 1980s. Forever by Judy Bloom. These are also quite old books. The Harry Potter series has been widely challenged for cult themes. Captain Underpants, uh, a bunch of different books. I'm curious to hear what you guys do with our writing assignment this week. The selling of books has changed radically in the past 40 years. Small independent booksellers were initially the way that people would buy books. And the strand was certainly not small. This is this image that we have here. This is a big bookstore in New York City, but it is independently owned and sells a mix of both new and used books, which was not uncommon in independent booksellers. These were put out in business by books by large booksellers uh, in the late 1980s, early 1990s. You started to see the expansion of these. And then these were themselves later put out of business or at least radically reduced in sales by the emergence of 
online booksellers like Amazon in the United States and Alibaba and many other parts of the world. The next step is we have ebooks, and ebooks have made books even more accessible, more transportable, and are more inexpensive to reproduce than previous kinds of printed books. They've also made increased profits for their sellers because they are cheaper to reproduce but can be sold for proximal costs, costs to printed books. They have also, however, largely reduced the royalties of writers and the publishing houses that work to produce them. Amazon, as one of the largest producers of ebooks at this point now, also has a great deal of control over pricing in the market. It quickly grew nine quickly grew to control 90% of the ebook market, which it used to leverage and to force book publishers to comply with its low prices, meaning that it paid them very low prices for access to the materials that they were selling or risk being dropped from Amazon's bookstore, which, as we all know, would be disastrous because they think many people find the books that they want to read through Amazon recommendation. So Amazon had also previously already done the same thing to print books, where it was a major player that we just discussed put out of business other really large corporate models. Amazon's price slashing caused most of the major trade book publishing corporations to endorse Apple's model for ebook e pricing, in which the publisher set the book prices and the digital bookseller gets 30% commission. So that would mean then that Apple doesn't get to set the price at all. They get to set, they get to put their commission on top of a price that's given to them by a publishing house so that the publishing house guarantees that not only do they, are they able to continue to produce the work, but that they're able to fairly pay royalties to the writers of the books. When the U.S. Department of Justice ruled in 2013 that Apple and other major publishers had colluded to set book price, ebook prices, denying consumers the lower prices that Amazon could offer, the booksellers responded that government investigations should be more concerned about Amazon. And of course, we're seeing that play out a lot more now uh, as we're becoming more aware of Amazon's labor practices, but also the effects that they've had on the producers of um, intellectual property. So whether that's books, audiobooks, what have you. We'll talk about this more when we get into the week on business, sorry, on the music industry. But you'll see that this trend of as things become digitally more accessible, the digital sellers have inserted themselves in the middle between the producer of the content, so the musician or the writer, and the necessary steps that have existed in the past. So whether that's a publishing house or a music producing agency, right? All of these things are then interrupted by the digital seller and they want to take a larger cut. And what happened is that everyone on this end, the production end, has had their their costs and pay radically reduced. And so there's been a lot of conversation about what to do about that, particularly in the music industry. But it's an issue in book publishing as well. As a solution to this, there's also a lot of people who have argued that books should be free. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And a, a number of illegal sites have sprung up posting free copies of ebooks, especially textbooks and other academic books, arguing that these should be open source, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. But before we dig a little further into publishing, the next thing that emerges after ebooks is audiobooks. And audiobooks explode in popularity very quickly from their emergence. But in 2000, around 2012, when they start to become quite popular and to, to present day, audiobooks were once primarily used by those with accessibility concerns, people who had visual impairments or for whatever other reason were less, less able to navigate printed text. Audiobooks were a resource for them. And also, they were common among niche markets. So, fun fact before the existence of digital e audiobooks, there were books on tape or, which is a misnomer because they were often on CDs by that point, that were very popular and were sold in truck stops because truck drivers were among the first to really adopt audiobooks because of long haul driving. But with the advent of platforms like Apple and Audible from Amazon that provided high quality recordings and ease of, ease of purchasing, and storage, the consumption of audiobooks drastically jumped from 2012 to 2016, and obviously that continues now. Book downloads more than doubled in sales in those four years. Amazon owns Audible, of course, the largest provider of audiobooks. Despite evidence showing that audiobooks have 
really worked to increase literacy and our exposure to textual information. There, of course, remains, as previously noted, people who remain anxious that the audiobook is going to lead to the decline of literacy in America. Amazon, like ebooks, is also one of the largest producers and one of, and definitely the highest grocer. So they make the most, as you can see here, from audiobook sales. There are alternative audiobook sites <clears throat> that are free and volunteer created. So if you think of something like Wikipedia, one of these is LibriVox. It's a long lasting one. But because they can only reproduce books that are no longer subject to copyright, they tend to be older books that are maybe less, less popular. It's a great place for finding classics. Also because they're volunteer read and they are not the familiar experience of listening to somebody who is a famous actor and they have a lower production quality, but they've been around for a long time as a free resource and are still, I think, a really great one. So even though the book industry is dominated by these large book publishers and one specific large retailer, there are still alternatives for both publishing and selling books. One idea has historically, as we said, been to make books free for everyone. And the idea isn't necessarily a new one. In the late 19th century or and early 20th centuries, industrialist Andrew Carnegie used his fortune to build more than 2,500 public libraries in the United States, Britain, Australia, and New Zealand, because Carnegie believed that libraries created learning opportunities for citizens, especially for immigrants like himself. And he believed that basically all books should be free. But this was the solution he had was to, to help build library structures. In publishing, one internet source, New Pages, is offering another alternative to conglomerate publishing and chain book selling by bringing together a vast array of alternative and small alternative and university presses. So these presses that, are, that don't belong to these large publishing houses as well as independent bookstores and guides to library and alternative magazines. So they're trying to counteract not only the limited availability and the idea that books are something we purchase individually, but also to bring into bring people into familiarity with things they might not know about because the algorithm really does limit how much we learn about when we depend on something like Amazon as a way to find out what books are out there. And then finally, because ebooks make publishing and distribution costs much lower, e-publishing has enabled authors to sidestep traditional publishers altogether. So a new breed of internet-based publishing houses, Ex Libris, iUniverse, Hillcrest, and others, design and distribute books for comparatively small prices for aspiring authors who want to self-publish a title, which can even be formatted for iKindle or iPad. And e-publishing is more accessible to people. And also, even though it's more accessible to people because large publishing houses might be looking specifically for books that are going to be blockbusters. And often young writers who are looking to, or new writers who are looking to self-publish, it's very unlikely that they'll ever reach that level. But sometimes it does happen. As our book points out, Fifty Shades of Grey was a fan fiction that was self-published by the author and did become a blockbuster. But typically what's amazing about e-publishing is that it allows people to self-publish books that would probably never reach that degree of, of visibility. And because of social media sites like Goodreads and others, books which may not appear through the large conglomerates or sell through Amazon still have an opportunity to be shared and talked about by many people. Books in the Future of Democracy. Just a few closing thoughts. It's important for us to remember that as, as text became more accessible for all of us, it radically changed the way that people think about ideas and think about who has a right to access them. It's connected people to new ideas and also to one another. Despite concerns that digitalization has led to us reading less, in fact, Pew studies show that we are reading roughly the same amount still of, of print books. And if anything, if we were to include audiobooks in this, it would show that we're reading more than we ever have, which is good news because it's important for our civic engagement. Readers are more likely to perform charity work. They tend to be more involved politically. Books and reading have survived the challenge of digital culture and managed to still continue to present us with new ideas. 
However, it's important for us to really think about the effects of large corporate structures and the limitations of what ideas and what books were being exposed to based on their algorithms and their sales reports. Great. Thank you so much. You can head over to the magazine lecture now or when you're ready. Have a good day. Thanks, guys.